Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Today I will be presenting a case of a 34 years old male who presented to ER with complaints of bilateral lower limb pain and swelling with blackish discoloration and blood formation. Okay. On initial 10 second assessment, patient is conscious and oriented obeying commands. Primary survey, airway is patent, no pulling of secretions, breathing, air entry bilaterally equal, no added sounds, saturation 99% on room air, respiratory 24 per minute. Circulation BP of 150 over 100 millimeters of mercury, pulse rate of 106 per minute, uh, CRT 2 seconds, disability GCS 15 out of 15, pu pupil cycle and reacting to light, pu moving all four limbs, exposure, uh, temperature of 99 degree Fahrenheit, GRB is 102, pain score of 6 out of 10, injection uh, paracetamol 1 gram IV stat was given. And pain was localized over the affected area or it was generalized pain? He was saying right uh, lower limb pain below knee he was saying okay. and a bilateral lower limb pain below knee. Advance of uh, primary survey, ECG uh, was taken with short sinus tachycardia and uh, VBG uh, taken short pH of 7.348, bicarb of 19.8, PCO to 38, lactate 1.8 and creat 1.7. Secondary survey, uh, you have a 34 year old male who is a non-smoker with occasional alcohol intake and no other comorbidities who presented with uh, initial he had complaints of bilateral lower limb pain and swelling uh, which was gradual onset and progress which progressively increased uh, 20 days back when he traveled to delhi and following cold exposure with uh, and he had no covering over the foot he was wearing chappals in delhi and he uh, accounted that it was very cold uh, in delhi and initially he had minimal uh, pain and swelling he didn't uh, care about that and he uh, continued to stand there and uh, further it uh, worsened and he started having uh, paresthesia and, and pain also. And after four days he noticed a blackish discoloration of both foot uh, which was also gradual onset and progressively increased. How many days later? Uh, around four days later. Hmm. And uh, uh, after uh, t t ten, uh, after that, uh, he also noticed, uh, started noticing blood formation on both foot and um, later, uh, five days later, he also noticed uh, yellowish discoloration of eyes and high colored urine. He was admitted in outside hospital for these uh, symptoms and uh, the, there uh, he had been uh, diagnosed uh, with uh, frostbite and uh, also uh, cellulitis with worsening of LFT and RFT. And, uh, and worsening of gangrene and uh, blood formations. He was referred here. There is no uh, history of any local trauma to the legs uh, so, or any uh, breathlessness, uh, syncope, altered sensorium, reduced urine output. Uh, patient uh, has no known allergy to any medications, uh, No, uh, not on any medications currently. Past history, no similar history of any complaints in the past. Uh, on examination, uh, patient is conscious oriented. Uh, ictus is present. Uh, no pallor, clubbing, cyanosis, uh, uh, lymphadenopathy, bilateral pitting pedal edema is also present. Mm -hmm. On uh, local examination inspection, there is bilateral lower limb erythema swelling and blackish discoloration up to uh, 3 cm uh, below angle with uh, blubs and areas of desquamation present. Okay. Palpation shows a local rise of temperature with the ten uh, tenderness above. Uh, the blackish discoloration mm -hmm. and there is a uh, sensory loss uh, in the uh, gangrenous region with uh, the dorsalis dorsalis pedis, pedis, uh, pedis is not uh, palpable and uh, coming to assisting examination no abnormalities are detected uh, investigations uh, we had uh, done a bilateral arterial and venous doppler uh, we will stop at that one you want to summarize what has happened now so we have a uh, 30 Four year old male Four -year -old gentleman uh, with history of uh, probable exposure to severe cold, uh, following which he had having uh, paresthesia over the pain, pain and paresthesia over the lower limbs. And in due course, over three to four days, he has noticed blackish discoloration, discoloration. which has progressed on to blebs. And now, uh, more like a gangrenous kind gangrenous. of state with secondary infection, he has presented yes. to us. On an uh, examination and all, he is otherwise hemodynamically fine. Uh, BP is uh, stable. Uh, mild tachycardia was noticed, okay. ephebrile. But uh, he has also has noticed uh, ictus of late, yeah. right? Uh, real functions also borderline elevated, 1.7 percent creatinine is noted. Uh, anything about the output? 
output uh, was uh, he was uh, not complaining of any reduced output. Not complaining of any. And uh, our no, there was no hyperkalemia, no acidosis. No, no, no. What's the relevance of hyperkalemia and acidosis in this patient with renal failure in such a scenario? If there is worsening of acidosis, hyperkalemia should be a plan for a dialysis. No, from an etiological perspective, what will be in your mind if you are expecting hyperkalemia? Uh, uh, Tissue loss. Tissue. So what? Rhabdo. Okay. So uh, that is the relevance of uh, looking at the potassium at that point because already RFT is going up. To. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then. Um. So that is from the history. So as long as the patient is hemodynamically fine and all, we can move on with the etiological evaluation, mm -hmm. right? Uh, diabetic status. No, there is no non-diabetic, yes, no, no other comorbidities, only occasional alcohol. Okay, okay. And uh, on palpation, you are not able to feel the dosage. Dosage speed is already not palpable. Okay. Both sides. So naturally, uh, our next next aim is to assess for the vascularity of the lower limb, right? Okay, proceed. So we have done uh, bilateral arterial and venous Doppler, but the arterial uh, Doppler there was normal flow in uh, all the arteries. Uh, in venous, there was uh, bilateral DVT. Uh, in bilateral soleal. Uh, veins and uh, left posterior tibial <coughs> bilateral DVT. Okay. DVT was present, but arterial flow was normal. Maybe because of the swelling, we couldn't uh, palpate the dorsal Okay. Total counts, it was uh, six. Is there any other way of looking at the perfusion? Palpation? CRT. You can place CRT a saturation no. problem. Ah, ah, Doppler. Doppler and your normal saturation, saturation problem, saturation you can problem. place and see whether you are getting a trace. Okay. okay. And handle Dopplers you can use handle to Doppler. assess also for the acoustic flow. Mm -hmm. Okay, then. Then coming to uh, lab investigation, total count of 6.76, uh, CRP was 80, procalcitonin of 1.46, urea 60, creatinine 1.76, platelet 1.25, LFTs were deranged, the total bilirubin of 13.62, direct bilirubin of 9.46, albumin 2.5, OTPTs elevated 98 and 96. ALP of 309, total CK of 1523. PT INR? PT INR of 1.61. Urine myoglobin was negative. Uh, D, di uh, D dimer was elevated at 8.11. Magnesium 1.6. Sodium potassium, uh, sodium 128, potassium 3.6. So, what's your explanation at this point for the altered liver functions? Uh, okay. Either it can be due to the sepsis component okay. or uh, other any other local pathology or in obstructive jaundice we have to rule out. Okay. And uh, ultrasound abdomen? Ultrasound abdomen done showed only uh, trace perinephric free fluid uh, and bilateral mild pleural effusion. Liver as such was uh, normal. Okay. Fine. Continue. Uh, and we have HbA1c was uh, 5.8. Uh, it was, no, uh, normal. It was normal. Okay. URE showed numerous pus cells but bacteria was negative, nitrate was positive. Okay. 10 to 15 RBCs were present. And the echo was also done for this patient. Uh, there was severe. Okay. What is the indication for echo? We have to check if uh, sepsis is causing any uh, myocarditis or yeah, any stress uh, cardiomyopathy. Uh, hemodynamically was fine and all. No? Ah, so indication will be we are having DVT, no? Ah, DVT is. Okay. Um, RRB dilatation. Yeah. And probably your tachycardia can also be explained because of those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fine. So, what did the echo show? Echo showed severe left ventricular uh, dysfunction with uh, RRB dilatation. Okay. Was present. Uh -huh. What next? Uh, next, uh, we had uh, started. Uh, Any other blood test you want to open at this point? D dimer? D dimer was elevated 8.11. Anyway, we have a proven DVT. Proven so. DVT. Fine. Okay. Then? Then you have to further plan for uh, because there is RIRB dilatation, you have further plan for CTPA. Fair. Rot in pulmonary embolus. Right. Uh, so, are you going to do a, go ahead with the CTPA in this patient because uh, creatinine is already 1.7, no, 1.8. No. So, we will huh? have to. Oh, okay, fine. So, there it is gone. We have to assess for the risk versus benefit of that procedure. Okay. Now, we have a patient with a very strong suspicion of uh, uh, pulmonary embolism because he has a proven DVT. He has also echo evidence of RV strain, right? Uh, then the question is, what extra thing are you going to do with a CTPA? Right? Uh, by proving a pulmonary embolism, what uh, different are you going to do? Anyway, we are going to treat the DVT. What is going to be the treatment for DVT? We will uh, start him on anticoagulation, we will uh, start for either monotherapy or dual therapy. Uh, for monotherapy, we will start either with apixaban or rivaroxaban. In dual therapy, we will start with uh, uh, initially LMWH, low molecular weight heparin, so anyway, We are planning for surgical we start on so it will be heparin only. Heparin. Other things can wait. Okay. We started on anoxaparin 0.6 ml BD. Okay. 
and then uh, we can uh, for a while uh, for later we can uh, change it to oral okay so it will be usually low molecular weight apparent apparent sir. and uh, initially we thought about some other agent for this patient no what was pontoparanex also so basically we are platelets was low no what is the platelets platelet is 1.25 1.25 okay fine so uh, what's the dose of uh, enoxaparin treatment dose enoxaparin uh, treatment dose it is uh, 1 g per kg uh, bd dosing oh fine sub q oh, right and sub q and pontoparanex in adult it will be approximately 7.5 okay 7.5 if the uh, weight is above 50 kg hmm? mm -hmm. right so ah uh, so the, uh, what we are discussing was that anyway the treatment option is going to be low molecular weight apparent, apparent. Hmm? and uh, he may not be a candidate for thrombolysis and he is hemodynamically fine otherwise so uh, that's the reason why we decided to hold off for the uh, ctpa for now and uh, uh, start treatment with anticoagulation okay right but in an, in a different kind of situation where uh, dvt was not proven but dramer is elevated with uh, echo evidence definitely for treatment we might need an additional uh, supportive uh, uh, test ctp okay then definitely ctp or if the patient was unstable definitely we should have got, uh, taken the risk and uh, explaining the risk mm -hmm. we should have gone ahead with the ctp CT pulmonary angiogram mm -hmm. any other test other than ct pulmonary angiogram for uh, the yeah, vq perfusion scanning vq scan vq scan theoretically as a rule especially in chronic pulmonary embolism acute pulmonary embolism it is uh, there can be gray areas but definitely there will be an alternative option okay fine now then we had started the patient on antibiotics uh, we had started injection meropenem 1 g tid and uh, with the uh, injection clindamycin 600 mg tid uh, <coughs> okay clindamycin what is the dose in necrotizing fasciitis clindamycin dose in necrotizing fasciitis why clindamycin is given in uh, in such infections infection because uh, for the antitoxin effect okay. so for the antitoxin effect the organ. dose is higher okay it is 900 mg tid okay. uh, usually uh, if he had initially presented with uh, frostbite mm -hmm. uh, we can initially uh, first there will be pre hospital uh, treatment okay we can give uh, initially uh, we have to take him to a warm environment and we have to spleen the affected area because he'll be having paresthesia and numbness so mm -hmm. he'll be prone for more injuries mm -hmm. and then we have to remove any wet clothing mm -hmm. and uh, we should not uh, rewarm in uh, hot water only warm water should be used for rewarming and also uh, no fire or direct heat uh, fire yeah, recommended temperature range we have to usually uh, warm in 37 to 39 degrees celsius mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we should not even uh, rub the areas uh, together also and um, uh, one once reaching hospital uh, we will uh, first have to do a rapid no, rewarm one one key thing we need to remember is that only if you can sustain the temperature you should be rewarming mm -hmm. okay now what happens is if the temperature is cold you transiently rewarm and the patient again mm -hmm. goes back to the old temperature then that can cause further damage okay so that is one uh, rewarming uh, re that is basically recooling okay. if it happens then again there will be accelerated yeah, damage. tissue damage. damage so you have to be able to sustain the rewarming process okay once you don't have uh, warm fluid and all then probably uh, alternative methods can also be used mm -hmm. hmm? right uh, and uh, once reaching hospital you have to start the rapid rewarming with uh, keeping and maintaining the temperature of the water at 37 to 39 degrees celsius okay ideally whirlpool method is usually used outside mm -hmm. here and uh, there should be general active motion while uh, rewarming and we should at least keep for 15 to 30 minutes our uh, go end point will be once the uh, tissues become soft to touch or it comes uh, red in color yeah. and uh, we should also give uh, during the rewarming process is very painful so we'll have to uh, supply, uh, give him opioids as well for the process yeah. hmm. then uh, if the patient uh, presents within uh, 24 hours uh, oh, what's the additional risk we are facing because it, most of the time the sensations will not so not be there so we should not hit the side walls of the uh, yeah. rewarming hmm. container if the uh, patient is uh, presenting within uh, 24 hours to our hospital uh, we can uh, start plan for uh, tissue uh, any uh, thrombolysis intravenous or intravenous thrombolysis can be planned mm -hmm. with uh, tissue plasmodium activated that is if there is a thrombus right Thromb yeah. Yeah. right if there is high risk uh, if he is high risk for any amputation uh, we can uh, plan for such treatment mm -hmm. 
and uh, usually if there is a, a doc, uh, clinically if you see cyanosis proximal to the distal phalanx usually uh, according to Amer american burn association we can uh, it will uh, come to a grade 3 or 4 mm -hmm. of injury of frostbite so we'll, for for the such patients we should actually plan for uh, thrombolysis mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we should also uh, rule out any bleeding risk for the patient before starting uh, thrombolysis okay. and uh, dosages uh, we should give 0.15 mg per kg over 15 minutes followed by 0.15 mg per kg per hour for 6 hours maximum dose is 100 mg mm -hmm. and then uh, we'll, after that we have to start him on either heparin or uh, low molecular weight heparin okay. if it is heparin we have to start him on 500 to 1000 unit per hour for 6 hours and until we achieve target APTT uh, twice the control value <laughs> or our anexaparin, if it is used, one same dose, one mg per kg should be used uh, as BD dosing for f at least 14 days. Okay. And uh, then, uh, if if, you, if the patient presents within 48 hours, uh, the, we can also use iloprost. Okay. Prostacycline analog can be used. Uh, and also in places where uh, plasminogen activator is contraindicated, as in bleeding risk patients, iloprost can be uh, tried, which is uh, 0.5 mg per kg per minute. And you have to increase every uh, for 30 minutes, uh, 0.5 mg per kg per minute. Okay. Maximum 2 mg per kg per minute. <coughs> you have to give for 6 hours per day for uh, at least 5 days. Okay. Then coming, next one uh, option is we have to, uh, next what you have to do is dressing of the wound. So you have to follow aseptic techniques while dressing the wound and uh, non adherent gauze should be kept as the first layer. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, in, in between the uh, to digits also, we have to keep uh, cotton dressings to prevent maceration. Mm -hmm. And uh, once you, after the rewarming, uh, keeping in the water bath, uh, you have to dry the wound completely before dressing. Okay. And uh, also, if there are any blisters, if it, we have to see if it is non-hemorrhagic or hemorrhagic. If it is non-hemorrhagic, we'll uh, drain the uh, blisters and also debride the blisters. Okay. But if it is hemorrhagic, we'll just slowly drain the blisters. Then uh, we'll have to also give uh, adequate analgesics and NSAIDs have to be given to reduce the inflammation. Okay. Then a TT prophylaxis also a tetanus uh, prone wound. So TT prophylaxis should also be started. IV antibiotics is indicated only if there is any evidence of infection. Okay. And uh, surgical also we have to uh, think uh, in case uh, uh, it, it might require like repeated debridement or fasciotomy, uh, sclerotomy uh, or any uh, amputation. Early amputation if there is any uh, spreading infection, early amputation will be required. Uh, then other uh, treatments, uh, but not uh, much evidence, is hyperbaric oxygen, pentoxyphylin. Okay. So once uh, these are all more like limb salvage kind of techniques. Salvage, no? yeah. So once the the gangrene has set in, then what else? Uh, once the gangrene has set in, we have to plan for amputation yeah. early. Usually you have to wait for the yeah. mummification process. Probably the line of demarcation, demarcation is set in, then you usually go for a guillotine yeah. amputation. amputation. Okay, right. So uh, what happened to this patient? Any idea? Uh, patient we, uh, we had admitted, uh, so uh, we had uh, planned uh, for amputation only. Okay. It has complete gangrene had set in already with the demarcation. Okay, fine. Anything else? The complications of uh, first bite also. Okay. Neurovascular injury okay. will be there. So further exposure to cold will cause immediate vascular spasm. Mm -hmm. So such patients, if there is a mild exposure uh, injury and all, for six months they will have to avoid cold exposure. If it is severe injury and all, they have to uh, advise uh, at least 12 months of uh, avoiding no, uh, cold exposure. Mm -hmm. Then uh, other complications, gangrene, then third infection, okay. uh, then not amputation can occur. Uh, then rarely only acute compartment syndrome will occur. Uh, then they'll have uh, residual symptoms of throbbing pain, burning sensations, intermittent paresthesias, uh, ischemic neuritis features, and you know, electric shock sensation. Uh, and long term sequelae, there can also be a scarring or tissue atrophy, uh, osteoarthritis also documented, uh, and bony abnormalities, peripheral neuropathy. Okay, thank you. Thank you.